so good to be with you this morning. I want to thank your elders for giving us, for inviting us here today, and for allowing us to preach during the worship service. And I want to thank Brother Wesley for sharing his pulpit with me. I'm here at New Hope this morning with my wife, Talanda. I don't know why she agreed to marry me 40 years ago, but she's stuck with me now. After all, a promise is a promise. 40 years ago, I only asked her for her hand in marriage. But five years ago, she gave me one of her kidneys, too. She is truly a gift from God, who she introduced me to 41 years ago. Talanda and I have been working among our military brethren for 21 years now. And this congregation is a generous supporter of this mission work. Some of you have supported this work individually over the years, too. And we want to thank you very much for helping us. This work of the Lord has been, without a doubt, the most rewarding work that Talanda and I have ever done. If any of you have any questions about this work, please ask me or Talanda. And be sure to get a copy of our 2015 mission trip report, which is out on the table in the foyer. Let me take just a moment before I begin the lesson to give you a few highlights from our 2015 mission trip among our military brethren. Last year, with your help, we worked in the mission fields during the months of April, May, and June. We fellowshiped three military congregations of the Lord's Church in Germany and two German congregations, two German Churches of Christ as well. We fellowshiped a military Church of Christ in Italy, Aviano, and one Italian Church of Christ. And we worked with an English Church of Christ in London, in the London area, just outside of London itself. We met this English church through our contact with Mission Printing in Arlington, Texas. It's a work of the church which supplies tracts for our military brethren throughout the world at no charge to them. This year, we have seven military churches of Christ already lined up in England, Germany, and Italy. And we have three German one Italian, and two English Churches of Christ as well. We have raised $18,500 of the 25000 that we need to raise this year. We will leave on this missionary trip on April 26th. You have to excuse me. Technology is not my strongest suit. Don't forget the handouts in the foyer which have a more detailed account, week by week account of our mission trip last year among our military brethren. I'd like to begin the lesson by repeating what uh, Brother Eli mentioned earlier okay, when he read the scripture in Matthew chapter 10 verse 38. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. The title of this lesson is Sowing the Seed. A couple shipped a playpen to friends who were blessed with, their, with the arrival of their fourth child in six years. Two weeks later, the mother of those four children responded with this note. Thanks, many thanks for the playpen. It comes in so handy. I sit in it every afternoon and read and think. When I'm in it, the children can't get near me. <laughs> I'm sure Wesley can, can uh, relate to that. We all need our space 
sometimes, don't we? But what do you do when there's space between the Lord and someone that you care very deeply about? In Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it tells about the unorthodox efforts of four unnamed heroes who used faith and works to get a broken friend to Jesus. Hearing that Jesus was in a house in Capernaum, these four men wanted to bring their crippled friend to, on a bed to Jesus. Finding the house full of people and their way to Jesus blocked, they uncovered the roof of the house where Jesus was and lowered the bed down on which their broken friend rested. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the crippled man, Son, your sins are forgiven you. This incident reminds us that faith sometimes requires a different point of view in getting lost people to Jesus. Four men who believed Jesus could make a profound difference in the life of their paralyzed friend refused to give up when they found that the way to Jesus was crowded and impossible to pass. At first, they must have wondered what they could do. Wouldn't it have been interesting to listen as these four men discussed their problem and how they could solve it? Faithless, negative thinking would have said nothing could be done because there were simply too many obstacles. But one of them must have lifted up his eyes and expressed a different point of view. One of the four friends must have suggested we, we can get on top of the house, tear the roof off, and lower him down to Jesus. You see, it was faith that helped them have a different point of view. As a result, the paralyzed man went home with a newly healed body and a freshly cleansed soul. Many preachers, elders, and Christians could use a different point of view like these four men had. I believe the devil has convinced some in the church that our job as Christians is to come, sit, and listen. But the soul-saving mentality of our Lord is summed up in the words found in Acts chapter 5 and verse 20, where it says, Go, stand in the temple, and speak to the people all the words of this life. Go, stand, speak, not come, sit, listen. I've heard Christians tell me they don't know anyone who is interested in God. But Jesus calls us to a different point of view. He says the harvest truly is plentiful. And lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Matthew 9, verse 37. Could it be many people are being kept from getting to Jesus because negative, faithless thinking is keeping us from getting to them. Faith can help us uncover the roof and see past what we alone can do and beyond to what we can do with God's help. Has faith really changed our point of view? Or do we tremble at the thought of reaching out to others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalm 126 is just six verses long, but its message is powerful. Listen as I read these scriptures. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears 
shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, I never really fully understood those who sow in tears and goes forth weeping, bearing seed, in verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 126, until Talanda and I went to Madras and then to Hyderabad, India, to work for the Lord. In central India, all the moisture comes in a four-month period, June, July, August, and September. After that, not a drop of rain falls for eight months. The ground cracks from dryness, and so do your hands and your feet. The winds pick up the dust, tossing it thousands of feet into the air. It comes down slowly across the city as a fine grit. It gets inside your eyes, ears, and mouths. It got inside my watch and stopped it. The year's food, of course, must all be grown in those four months of the monsoon season. People mostly grow basmati rice in small fields. October and November are beautiful months in India. The buildings where the rice is stored are full. The harvest has come. People are grateful and happy. They eat two meals a day. The rice is boiled in great iron kettles and then allowed to steam between palm leaves. The rice is covered then in curry sauce and when eaten lies heavy on their stomachs so they can sleep at night. When December comes, the stored rice from the harvest starts to recede and many families omit the morning meal. Certainly by January, not one family in 50 is still eating two meals a day. By February, the evening meal diminishes in size. The meal shrinks even more during the month, month of March and children succumb to sickness. You don't stay healthy on half a meal a day. April is the month that haunts my memory the most. In it, you can hear hungry children crying in the evenings. By this time, most of the days are passed with only one evening cup of rice. Many have nothing to eat at all. An Indian preacher told me this story while Talanda and I worked in India. A six-year-old boy comes running to his father one day, and he's all excited. Daddy, Daddy, we've got rice, he shouts. Son, you know we haven't had rice for weeks. Yes, we have, the boy insists. Out in the hut, there's a cloth sack hanging on the wall. I reached up and put my hand down inside. Daddy, there's rice in there. Give it to Mommy so she can make rice, and tonight we can sleep with full tummies. The father stands motionless for a moment. Son, we can't do that, he softly explains. That's next year's seed rice. It's the only thing between us and starvation. We're waiting for the rains, and then we must use it. The rains finally do arrive in June, and when they do, the young boy watches as his father takes that sack from the wall and does the most unreasonable thing that child can imagine. Instead of feeding his desperately weakened family, he goes to the field, and with tears streaming down his face, he takes that precious rice and throws it away. He scatters it into the dirt. Why? Because he believes in the harvest. 
The rice is his. He owns it. He can do anything with it he wants. The act of sowing it hurts so much that he cries as he sows. But as the Indian preachers say when they preach on Psalm 126, brothers and sisters, this is God's law of the harvest. Don't expect to re rejoice later on unless you have been willing to sow in tears. I want to ask you this morning, are you willing to sow in tears? I don't mean just assembling together on Sunday and Wednesday, which is also important and commanded. But finding a way to say, I believe in the harvest and I'm doing something about it. Like those four men in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, who brought their broken friend to Jesus, we must bring our broken friends to the Lord as well. That will require an entirely different point of view on our part. And perhaps we too must sow in tears. But if you haven't obeyed the gospel yourself, you must first bring yourself to the Lord before you can bring any friends or family. The price for your salvation has been paid by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's required of us is obedient faith. When we hear the word of God preached, or when we read it, we must believe that it is truly his word. We must repent of the sins in our life and confess before others that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then to be immersed, baptized for the remission of our sins. At that time, the Lord himself will add you to his church, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. If you are a Christian and there is sin in your life, if you repent of that sin, according to the Hebrew writer, God will forgive you and remember that sin no more. Or if you need the prayers of the church, won't you come as together we stand and are led in this song of invitation.